Hi, my name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you're listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast, a show about application development and management at scale. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to thank HPE Cloud, our sponsor for this week's episode of The New Stack Analyst. HPE Cloud offers an open enterprise-grade hybrid cloud portfolio of solutions and professional services. It drives that hybrid infrastructure, enables developers, and provides a unified solution. You should check them out, HPE Cloud. Hey, it's Alex Williams with the New Stack here for the New Stack Analyst Show with guests today from HPE. Joining us as my co-host is Job Jackson. Hey, Job. Hello. And we have a special guest today, an analyst who we've known for a while, Shuram Subramanian of CloudDon. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me here. Uh, you're welcome. And our guest from HPE is Nick Garkusha, who is a Helium, hey. Hey, Helium Technical Marketing Lead. Hey, hey, Nick. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Great. And so really the topic today is what's new with HPE CES 10 and really what developers need to know about it. And so, Nick, why don't we just get started in helping us understand what is HPE CS10? Well, CS stands for Cloud System, and Cloud System 10 is our leading uh, offering in the cloud space. Uh, and what Cloud System does is it enables a very simple on-ramp to cloud in an enterprise environment. So as, as everybody knows, building clouds could be challenging and it's not a, as simple as coming in and running one installer and all of a sudden you have your cloud going. Um, when, you, when you're trying to build a multi-cloud environment or a hybrid cloud environment, and what that means is that when you think about cloud as a holistic approach, we would love to um, have something that is as simple as just one click install, but in reality it's actually a, a, a set of processes and services and thinking about ways to integrate uh, different clouds, different environments, um, ways to bring all of the disparate uh, resources together under one umbrella. Uh, and that is what Cloud System attempts to do and does so very well, we believe. It's ability to run all of the different cloud environments uh, within one framework, within one, one ecosystem, and allowing developers to take advantage of that. So it's like a cloud broker of sorts. Correct. Yeah. So one of the components within cloud system is the ability to, to broker multiple different services, uh, including public cloud uh, services as what we call a provider model. It's a, really, it's a really powerful model when you think about it because uh, it exposes ability to build applications targeting different environments, but having all of those environments uh, be centrally managed, centrally controlled by the IT operations team. So, in essence, it helps to deal with issues like shadow IT. Terrific. Uh, now, you guys are, are using a uh, application-first approach to this, um, I understand. I mean, that's how you build it, to prioritize the deployment of the application. Yeah, in essence, when, when you think about Cloud System 10, what makes it so unique is, is it allows the, um, a, a developer-centric view of, uh, the app, of the infrastructure. And what this means is that if you're a developer and you would like to take advantage of different um, infrastructure services, IaaS providers, you can do so very easily. As a developer, you can go, can go in through a uh, self-service portal um, and request a resource to be provisioned for you. Uh, again, as I mentioned, these are centrally controlled and managed, but it gives the flexibility for a developer to do so with just a couple of clicks and get an environment stood up for whether it is development, uh, testing, or production. And uh, at the same time, if you are you know, past the IS stage, you would like to use a platform as a service approach, we have that as well as part of cloud system. Um, is, and, and this is provided by HP, HP Helium Staccato, which is our Cloud Foundry based, based solution that gives developers yet another flexible choice of technologies. 
So in essence, um, when we were building this, we we're, were very much concerned with ability for developers and line of businesses, organizations to have a choice. Now, you want to build traditional applications or support traditional applications, you can do so with cloud system. If you wanted to extend uh, those applications by adding additional components, let's just say mobile front end or some kind of web service, you could do so in either a cloud native environment um, using uh, Helen HP Helen Staccato, or you can do so running on containers, or you can do so running on VMs. The choice is yours. Great, great. Um, so you mentioned about uh, the IS, multiple IS environments, and also like kind of enabling pass kind of uh, um, environments, right? That's great. So uh, kind of, uh, I mean, you, there's a multiple st stacks to talk here. Maybe we can start from up, uh, from top down. What kind of mobile environments do you support? Yeah, so so typically when you when you build out uh, mobile applications, you need some kind of a backend. And from the backend standpoint, the choice is really is up to you whether you wanted to run that uh, those those uh, services and containers. Uh, running them, and you, you wanted to talk about high-level services, it means, you know, if you have runtimes in .NET, Java, Python, Ruby, all of those are supported uh, environments within uh, the higher level uh, of abstraction of these uh, resources, which is provided by HP Helion Staccato. It's our PaaS platform as a service platform. So um, when, we, when we think about uh, mobile, but could be also any other services that you're trying to enable, you can bring those runtimes and run them within the PaaS platform um, very easily. And also there's very tight integration with the developer um, workflows. So CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, as well as uh, IDE, so development environments like Visual Studio. Uh, all of those are the easiest way to get going. Nice. Does it also support Go? Uh, Go is uh, one of the la language packs that you could also deploy. Yes, it's it's um, it, it is um, it, there there with Cloud Foundry, and we have a Cloud Foundry certified distribution as as part of this uh, deployment. You are able to run multiple different language packs. So it really is a function of the upstream Cloud Foundry community and what that uh, what that supports, which is a nice thing. Is you get that flexibility, built-in extensibility as well. Okay, that's great. Yeah, one of the one of the cool things that we see developers are using this for is just being able to rapidly prototype solutions. So being able to do so in different industry like financial services uh, or retail or transportation, uh, public sector, et cetera. So you know, you know, a lot of times the innovation is a bit challenging when it takes months or weeks to stand up an environment to 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 do something. With Cloud Foundry, um, you have a faster path to innovate and you talk about Go and you know some of the uh, happening languages that are uh, you know developers just are dying to go and try and use you now have access to that with uh, through um, this you know still a very um, centrally managed gov with a strong governance model security model built in uh, but uh, now you're able to give those resources to developers developers and they can immediately start taking advantage of these new technologies, new services, um, uh, Redis, Mongo, et cetera, whatever the developers and the line of businesses need to do to innovate in their business, they can do so right out of the box. So that's what you mean when you talk about, uh, I guess, reducing shadow IT. What you're saying is an organization could stand this up and tell uh, its individual lines of business or uh, development teams that don't worry, you don't, you don't need to go to Azure to get yourself a quick um, uh, virtual machine has come through this portal instead, I take it. Yeah, you know, you know what you just described is a, is a, a classic model of uh, a way to abstract away not only the, um, some of the concerns that we have around cost, right, as organizations, but also concerns around duplicating um, resources that might not be leveraged as effectively as they could have. And what we, what we provide with Cloud System is a way to um, start looping those different um, organizations into one central uh, workflow where everything uh, is managed, but also you, you see, it's managed centrally, but also you can see very easily where you need to invest your resources, right? Where you need to drive additional capacity, be it 
public cloud or different public cloud providers or be it private cloud. Um, but then additional, um, additional features which kind of differentiate cloud system uh, also are a way to help trans start transforming applications. So taking applications that traditionally may have been running in, in a private cloud environment and figure out a ways, ways to leverage those um, resources in the public cloud more effectively. At the same time, providing that central visibility into the spend, uh, chargeback, governance models, et cetera, that, that, that organizations so need. So, you know, it's not just the separate provider models that you have, but also the ability to build out um, different organizations, manage their users, manage organizational admins. So it gives a lot more of a granular control to these resources. And at the same time, you give the power to the lines of businesses and those orgs to uh, manage their own IT themselves, while obviously everything is still running within one, one central framework. So, so what do you see developers doing? Do you, I mean, are they, you know, when they're getting started in using this environment, are they using one cloud service at a time? What are some of the patterns you're seeing in usage? That's a great question. Um, typically, we see that there are, there are line of business developers that sometimes, well, more oftentimes, have to man maintain uh, existing applications. Uh, not everybody builds cloud-native you know, Facebook or Twitter-like applications uh, using the development models that we also hope to, to be more like. Uh, a lot of applications are traditional. So a lot of the developers within those environments uh, take advantage of the flexibility and ability to deploy extra capacity to, to support those traditional applications. So essentially managing the existing environments, but in a more of a, what I would say, flexible and scalable model. Ability to drop components visually um, in, and enabling additional capacity for a traditional application is sort of one of the key values what a, what a cloud should provide, being able to do so very easily on the op operator side. But to be able to request that and to be able to have a subscription, which what developers or lines of businesses do, um, to, to enable the growth, to enable dynamic growth, saying, hey, my application, my, my database tier needs additional uh, compute units, can, can, can the system automatically provision uh, provision uh, those resources for me is the first use case that we see. It's kind of the traditional traditional use case. Um, second, uh, very interesting use case is about extending applications. So you would have um, a traditional app, let's just say, you know, as, as for, for instance, a flight reservation system uh, running within a private cloud environment, but now you need to add additional pieces like flight tracker or maybe seat selection application or enabling your um, your check-in counter with a mobile app. Um, we see some developers are now jumping into uh, ability to ex expose the traditional applications uh, services as APIs, and then connecting to those APIs via mobile services, mobile applications, web applications, um, and that that again is the speaks to being able to start extending and doing more with the with the traditional environments. And the third one is about being able to innovate, innovate fast, and I already spoke to that, is ability to stand up environments and just do completely new things, um, enabling new paradigms, uh, helping change the way business is doing um, business today. And that is the kind of pushing the boundaries of what lines of businesses were able to do today. And obviously this is why public cloud is, has been so popular, is ability to give that compute, give that networking storage, those extra services um, with a, you know, with a click of a button and a swipe of a credit card. That is what cloud system is, is, is enabling to do is essentially start in a point where a lot of organizations are, but also bring those capabilities to their full, full capabilities, um, you know, f f ability to tie in the traditional environments and the cloud native environments together. Um, and again, that's all done within one framework, that's cloud system 10. So, so Nick, um, you mentioned about uh, the public cloud, and you know, out of the three things, the common thread is like you know the developers or, or the when the applications need to need more resources, kind of uh, um, auto scaling, right? So that kind of brings into you know like do you do you see developers running applications that kind of run on or start with the private private data center environment and bursting into cloud, or, or what kind of hybrid scenarios are you seeing? Um, 
it's yeah. A, so I think your question. Okay. So so you, your your question is a really good one. Um, the you know the promise of um, hybrid has been around bursting to cloud, and I think that um, we have seen those come to life uh, in in some scenarios. But I think the very common scenarios at this point are multi cloud scenarios. So meaning that you have some resources running in. Uh, in, in private cloud and in a traditional environment, and then you start extending services into public cloud and then connecting them together. Um, it's really the question about what, you know, what is the most um, most appropriate or most common or optimized use case for today's business uh, while keeping an eye open for what's possible down the road. Uh, we absolutely can support um, capabilities uh, for you know, multi-cloud, which is what customers are looking for today. Hey, I need, some, you know, I want to be able to use this cloud provider or this model, be it platform as a service or our VMs running IaaS or even containers, but I want to be able to do so across different providers. That is the use case that we have seen day in, day in, day out, all the time. Customers are looking to really leverage the power of multi-cloud and being able to, to connect the dots across different apps. Um, so, the cloud bursting is interesting, but we have not, um, to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's something that is really based on specific use cases, and specific customers wanting to do so with specific workloads. So, you know, it's, as, a, as a general statement, um, you, we see customers starting today with multi-cloud and then starting to think about, hey, what is that cloud burst scenario, hybrid cloud scenario would really be? The nice thing is that cloud system is, is there. It's set up for that scenario as well. You know, we've done, uh, we've done workflows through um, a core engine of cloud systems called uh, Cloud Service Automation, CSA, uh, which enables those. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, the reality is that a lot of and by, a lot of applications today are still traditional, and some of those applications are not well suited for public cloud. Uh, and some applications are great for public cloud, and you know we often see different components, different services, just talking to each other very nicely through APIs. So, um, so, so mostly multi-cloud is what you are seeing uh, being adopted or being used. So, what kind of when when you say multi-cloud, like you know, in theory you could support a lot of environments like AWS, Azure, OpenStack, VMware, right? But what do you see? What do you really support, and what ha what what kind of Cloud environments have been used by your by your customers. Yeah, so you named them. You know, we uh, the the beauty of cloud system is the provider model that's very flexible. So if there is a cloud provider or a cloud model that's coming out that we are not targeting yet, we can and we will because again, it's a it's a it's a plug and play type of services architecture. So you can say. Uh, and we need to target a new provider. Typically, that provider will have will, will have APIs um, for their services. So we build wrappers around those APIs and bring them into this one model. Then, then the central IT can use to model these hybrid cloud or multi-cloud applications. Um, but to answer your specific question, it is it is ability for us to support public cloud providers of you know of choice today. Um, uh, Microsoft Azure being you know the first first one, and and Azure um, Amazon AWS. Um, but also under the covers, when we first bring in cloud system, you have also access to the full power of OpenStack with Helium OpenStack 3.0. Uh, which is a fully com fully open stack compatible distribution, and that brings into focus ability for us to rapidly enable a, an organization with a very powerful private cloud environment. Um, again, this is something that is uh, a, a huge value proposition to customers. We have see a lot of our customers. Uh, leveraging that to start deploying workloads into into private cloud and also replatform uh, their traditional workloads into the OpenStack based uh, environment, which provides more flexibility, ability to define um, things like software defined networks, firewall um, configurations, um, and then additional value add that we built into OpenStack around monitoring and lifecycle management of your cloud. So, you know, to again, to kind of step back and to say, what do customers use today? Absolutely, they connect into, into public cloud as providers, and we have use cases for that. And they're also connect, connect into their traditional environments, uh, traditional private cloud environments, so both uh, VMware-based and OpenStack-based. So ability to do all of those in, under one package is, is kind of what's, what's, what's really cool about cloud system. Great. So um, do you, 
you mentioned Amazon and you mentioned AWS and Azure. So do you support Google Cloud yet? Or if not, what is your plan for supporting Google Cloud? Yeah, we, I, can't, I can't speak uh, to the, in terms of the roadmap and the plan, but um, again, it suffice to say that we have uh, been very rapidly, very rapidly targeting what customers are looking for and what customers were requiring in terms of capabilities. So while we, uh, I believe, don't support uh, some of the Google Compute services, I'm sure they're either on their roadmap or are being discussed by our product teams. Um, that has happened today, you know, with containers and containers have been exploding the last you know, couple of years and we've been adding rapidly capabilities to support different type of container providers. So, you know, from, from Docker to, to Mesosphere, D, um, DCOS and um, Docker UCP, for example. Um, again, the, the, the ability to bring this in as a, as a quite literally plug-in capability that uh, will get you going really fast with a new provider is what's, what's the beautiful piece about cloud system. Thanks, Nick. Terrific, terrific. No um, problem. Uh, I was kind of curious. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about chargeback. Uh, so it, this, I would imagine, would would give you or give the company a a total bill of what everybody was spending on AWS, on AWS, or on Azure. Uh, does it also allow you to um, uh, get numbers by per different business unit or some other metric? And how do I? Is there a way I could pipeline these numbers into other? Uh, uh, other like ERP systems or something like that. Yeah, so the cloud system, uh, cloud system as uh, a solution has a set of technologies that enable um, a, a very granular organization based approach where uh, each organization is able to manage their own resources uh, and that is able to provide those resources to their internal users and also track chargeback across those resources centrally. So each organization is able to have their own usage, usage reports and their own billing reports. And the central IT ops function that exposes all the various resources is able to include specific subscription pricing, um, meaning that's internal pricing that each of the business units is able to see. And that model allows for uh, more flexibility in terms of the um, for example, for private cloud environments, the additional effort it takes to stand up um, or automate or script out more complex use cases, which might cost internal a little bit more, uh, versus a uh, type of pricing that is maybe more passed down pricing from, from exposing uh, public cloud provider resources. Um, the, you know, the, the, one of the key things to remember is that because this is, in essence, a multi-tenant uh, type of system, you are able to uh, set up the structure, the organizations, and the quotas and the limits that you choose to to expose to your end users or to your organizations. And that centrally, again, is tracked. Uh, each of the end users on a business, uh, when they run and order subscriptions, they see the pricing. They see this adding added to their quote-unquote shopping cart. Um, they also get reports. They also are able to see, obviously, the usage across an organization. And all that trickles down into various reporting systems that could be exposed on the, on the back end to uh, f financial systems and, um, you know, through, again, through APIs to other types of services. Um, the, the model is really flexible in so far as to enable you to provide IT uh, with that central control, uh, making sure that compliance and governance model is, is built into the product, and this is what's built into cloud service automation, and um, also ability to um, essentially have full visibility of, of your infrastructure resources at, at any point, and ability to then connect that back into kind of best-in-class hardware that we have with um, HP Synergy or other hardware platforms that we support is being able to essentially say, when you need additional resources, we will trigger specific um, specific workflows to create additional um, capacity in your environment. And again, uh, the IT is able to control all of those granular models and pass on the pricing to their end users. Let's take a quick break and get back to the show. We 
We'd like to thank HPE Cloud, our sponsor for this week's episode of the News Tech Analyst. HPE Cloud offers an open enterprise grade hybrid cloud portfolio of solutions and professional services. It drives that hybrid infrastructure, enables developers, and provides a unified solution. You should check them out HPE Cloud. Now let's get back to the show. Nick, you mentioned about uh, being able to add rules for governance and compliance, right? Being able to uh, control uh, or monitor and um, able to do that. How do you how do you enforce that? Or how do you enforce governance policies uh, when used in a multi-cloud environment, right? If it is if it is just yeah, OpenStack so- or VMware, it's a lot easier. But if, if my environment, my end customer has got a, a multi-cloud environment, how are you able to, how are they able to set common policies and how are they able to enforce them? Yeah, well, the, the limits and, and the kind of the, um, the conditions of your subscriptions are controlled through an offering that's published out. So it's, there's a, actually a very interesting model when, we, when you look under the covers of cloud system. Typically, you would expect an IT ops person to build a template, right? And then say, hey, this is the template that I'm going to pass on to my organization. And the organization or the end users will go ahead and run the template. And there is obviously different resources across multiple clouds, like in the scenario you outlined. Um, with cloud system and the cloud service automation that powers the, these scenarios, there's actually an intermediary step of an offering that's p- published out. And this offering sets different criteria as to how much capacity you would like to enable, would you can enable, you can turn on and turn off. Um, and it's a very granular set of uh, rules based on the resources that you expose in that model. In other words, if you have an application that's using n amount of servers and then y, you know, x amount of um, database resources and some networking, um, it's constrained that that model is constrained to the resources that you choose to expose and then the requirements and the limits that you set as an IT operator. Um, furthermore, as the line of business um, administrator, the person that manages kind of resources for that specific team can further enhance that um, with, with, their, with, their, with their own capabilities that are just sort of built into, uh, in, into this offering model that I mentioned earlier. So in, in essence, before something is used, it really is already the, the compliance and the kind of the, the governance aspects are built into the actual model that's offered by cloud service automation. And that ensures that there is, aren't any surprises. So you can't really scale a resource to you know a thousand nodes if the prescriptive model that's been set out by IT is only up to 20 nodes um, and again those limits are controlled then between the line of business um, administrators so people that are responsible for the success of their business and then the central IT ops so together they're able to establish what these criteria should be so for certain applications, you'll say, hey, you can only scale it up to five nodes because today they're only using between one and two nodes. And, you know, five could be the absolute maximum limit that we can allow them to do so. Um, and for some other applications, it could be, um, you know, completely different set of resources exposed with limits exposed in a different way. But again, that's, those are centrally managed and um, kind of very well controlled at different levels of granularity. Great. Thank you. Of course. Uh, uh, wondering if you could tell me a bit about what the uh, uh, installation process is like. Is this a job for, is this something that a couple system administrators could do with uh, some uh, software, or is this more like a, a kind of a project along the lines of, uh, you know, setting up an ERP system? Yeah, so we have made um, significant inroads with making installation uh, much simpler. So installation deployment really has been improved uh, and it has been pretty straightforward. I mean, when I, when I look at it, and I've done a couple of these installs, um, it is a kind of appliance based uh, installation process. You walk through a wizard, you focus on set of, you know, answering a set of questions, uh, connecting into uh, your networking, configuring your networking. Uh, but, you know, with, you know, within a matter of a few hours, you are a- able to stand up the control plane for your cloud system, enterprise, for in your appliances. And then, because of the tight integration with uh, underlying um, 
frameworks, be it uh, Helium OpenStack, you can you can further enhance and you can further configure additional uh, things like networking further down the road. And that's one of the interesting things that we have found out is we, we, we want to be able to let customers get going really fast. That's a really important value uh, that we bring with cloud system. But at the same time, stay flexible so that later on you're able to come in and reconfigure your, your services, your control plan, uh, configure um, additional things like clustering, et cetera. Uh, and that, that again is provided as part of the value to the operator. So to answer your question, yes, it is easy to get going. It is easy to get started and it is easy to, um, to start adding additional services or configure things post your initial install. So Nick, um, I have a kind of a related question, um, kind of going back to the multi-cloud uh, question. So you mentioned that yeah. uh, on a private cloud environment, you support OpenStack and VMware. Uh, do you with CS10 does it do you have does it support Azure Stack yet, or is that in plan yet? There are absolutely plans. Uh, there, you know, we as we know, there's a lot of work that's being done on both sides of HP, HP, and Microsoft as well to enable um, a lot of very interesting scenarios with the Azure Stack. Um, currently, it's uh, it's not in the box. It is. It is again very straight up, straightforward thing to do to to add down the road if that's what our customers are looking to do. Yeah, that, this seems to be kind of a good segue to talk about containers in many ways too, because that is one of the promise of containers, isn't it? To be able to use you know tools that you might use in a Linux environment versus a Windows environment, right? And yes, I'm curious on you know on, on on your guys' philosophy about that approach, and maybe particularly about Azure, and, you know and these varying different types of operating systems that you can enable containers to really take advantage of. Yeah, we, we have, uh, we have heard our customers early on when they start to get interest in containers and because we had the provider model that was so flexible, we, we said, Hey, we want to be able to provide container as a service as part of cloud system. In, in fact, as, as a part and parcel of what we can, can enable our scenarios such as, um, if you are a developer and you want to bring your own image, um, you can do so today with Staccato, HP Helium Staccato. Out of the box, you can say, run this image for me, and uh, you, can, you can enable that as the very kind of foundational scenario for a lot of dev and test uh, use cases. Uh, if you wanted to now take that container image and deploy it in production, you can do so either as part of your uh, OpenStack install, which again is, is part of Cloud System 10, or you can enable that on other services. So uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we, we, have, um, we have support for um, Mesosphere DCOS, uh, ability to run images in Docker UCP, ability to run Docker on hardware, um, ability to run Docker and, on VMs. So, uh, that is the flexibility I think that is that offers a lot of promise to our customers, a lot of uh, kind of consistent uh, experience that you would expect for a container to perform. But also, it's a it's a bit of a challenge because it's a different model, right? And and again, when we when we talk to the enterprises, um, they are asking questions like, what is the right provider? What is the right model? Which of my applications could be containerized? And just because you can stick everything into one container. Um, and run an entire application stack inside one container doesn't mean it's containerized, right? I mean, it's, it requires a change in paradigm in the way developers approach uh, building applications. And that's sort of an ongoing process. And there are, it's a very dynamic space. We're super excited to be part, part of it and support the different options that customers may want to choose right up front. Ability to do so and the choice and the flexibility is what kind of sets a cloud system apart and um, provides kind of best of both worlds and not necessarily locking yourself in into one paradigm or one provider and, you know, start building as you go. So how do you think about, you know, the, the abstraction of containers themselves? Because you know, there's Docker and there's other container abstractions that we're starting to see emerge, for instance, out of uh, OCI, uh, you know, and, and so then even beyond that, now you have, customers are going to have to be thinking about, well, how am I going to run all these things in production and really assembling all those pieces together? And that's where you start. Yeah. They start to think about microservices and orchestration platforms and, you know, and, and that whole process of really 
continuous development, that's really so critical. And that's why you would, I think, really try to leverage containers in the first place. Um, <clears throat> Correct. So I'm just curious on like, you know, what, what are, how are you, what's your philosophy? What are container, what are, what are customers asking about? Uh, you know, what are they really trying to do? And are you guys supporting Kubernetes? Are you supporting other orchestration environments? Really looking for just a summary of where you are. Yeah, so um, I think you had a lot of good points there and a couple of questions uh, baked into into that. I think the first piece is a question around how do we empower uh, developers that are looking to, looking to take advantage of containers. Um, I think the, the first um, thing that we typically approach is approach uh, conversations with is, is conversation around microservices and a way to really start doing the the right um, the right an analysis of which applications are the prime targets to go to into the microservices based model, which naturally lends itself into conversation around well how do you enable that in in dev test and prod, and staccato has proven to be a really great environment, HP Helium Staccato, which is our Cloud Foundry distribution, proved to be a very um, useful framework to leverage right off the get-go for some of these organizations and these developers. Um, because they are able to start exploring and building um, prototypes and extending their, their systems and trying to see how the services actually work together using PaaS as the way to get going really, really fast. And we have enabled Docker experience behind, um, uh, be essentially as, as the foundation of HP Helium Staccato, it runs Docker containers. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you can also uh, expose your own, bring your own container um, scenarios within Staccato as well. So we found, found that to be a very useful framework to have the, the, this initial conversation with customers about going cloud native, uh, taking their applications into the cloud native world. Um, when we start to think about um, the second very important question, which is what are the orchestration frameworks? Which ones are the right ones? Um, this is really the, you know, this is a very dynamic market and we see a lot of frameworks coming up and we are working to add support to, to, to a lot of them, to most of them. Um, uh, Mesosphere is kind of the, the, the one that we selected and have been working on uh, to enable, and it's, it's something that some are, uh, you know, we've actually built really cool demos showing the kind of multi-container world, and Mesosphere is one of them. Uh, Docker UCP I mentioned, Kubernetes is in the process. Um, and others will pop up. And I think this is the um, opportunity for our customers to get going, start to re-platform or re rework the, the way the experience actually, well, the way that their developer, development teams are actually working. Um, you mentioned CICD. I mean, part of the core value proposition of cloud system is, and baked into the, the staccato uh, platform is uh, Helium Code Engine. Uh, code Engine is, a, is our approach for managing CICD pipelines. And why is it so interesting? It's because within Code Engine, you have baked in a simplicity of uh, targeting a um, deployment environment for Staccato that could be on any cloud. So again, it could be running on AWS. You can have Staccato running on Azure. You can have Staccato running on OpenStack, Staccato running on VMware environment. Um, and that becomes a uh, really critical pivot point where as, as, you're, as you start thinking about your multi-cloud strategy, but also multi-container strategy, you don't have to pick one. You don't have to say, hey, we're going to standardize uh, today on just AWS or just a different cloud provider, OpenStack, et cetera. Um, if you target containers and leverage Staccato as your container management framework, we are able to deploy that in multiple different cloud, um, cloud platforms. At the same time, some customers may say, hey, I, you know what, Staccato is great. We use it for PaaS, but I just really want to uh, leverage a different cloud orchestration platform like you know, Kubernetes or Mesos, uh, Mesosphere, and we can do that as well. We can offer the flexibility through the provider model that I spoke to earlier within cloud service automation. And, and that is the kind of the future and the flexibility and the openness that we offer with our stack is ability to um, not necessarily pick and choose and tie yourself into one technology or one container format or one way even to 
to enable that because different teams have different processes, as we all know, and different organizations and even different developers within the same org may have preference for one workflow versus the other. Um, we are able to um, open those as choices within a, an environment. And this is what Cloud System does really well. It's something that we see a lot of customers um, seeing as big value proposition to offer to their organizations. Great, great, Nick. It's actually, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the flexibility that you provide with container orchestration and just as like, you know, it's something that customers would love. Um, you mentioned uh, it, the CACD pipeline that supported this HPE coder. So uh, what, what, suppose if the developer or if the customer is uh, used to Jenkins-based CACD or, or, you know, like even Visual Studio-based CACD environment, what is your recommendation? How do they go about that? Is it possible to, is, are they supported or is it more like the, do they have to move the coder? No, I think I, I, the, so here, you know, the reality is that we are not enforcing anybody's, you know, we're not enforcing any particular view or any particular approach um, and saying, hey, you must use this tooling. Um, you really have the choice. You can use Codar, which is uh, a part of the, um, it's part of, uh, the offering of, of the broader cloud system enterprise, which includes uh, essentially your your uh, release management or release management pipeline framework. Um, and it usually targets traditional applications and it usually is targeted for traditional application environments. Um, the engine I mentioned as part of Helium Staccato is actually a code engine. And code engine is a, a different CI CD pipeline targeting um, a Git-based uh, uh, repo uh, approach to essentially enable your CI/CD uh, within um, either uh, public uh, repos or private repos, and being able to do so very easily and without much setup. So essentially, it's just go get going really fast. You specify a couple of options via a very simple uh, kind of wizard interface, and you're able to start. Uh, pushing your changes to your Git repo, and then those get picked up in your environment, in your production environment, dev environment. Um, so because we have the flexibility of choices, you are you you can choose. You know, you can run one that makes sense to you. If you are using Jenkins, if you're if you want to use your um, your existing workflow workflows set up. Um, that way you can configure them. You configure them within your IS provider of choice, and you can run deployments of entire dev test uh, plus CICD uh, cluster within one click. You know, essentially as a developer, you go in and say, hey, I'm gonna request my environment, my dev environment to be stood up. You can do so without having code or without having code engine. You can quite literally just you know do your own if you wanted to. So it's the, having the flexibility of kind of uh, very easy to get going immediately cloud native centric code engine. Um, the release pipeline management, second option, uh, re release pipeline management offered by Codar, which is more and more uh, extensive and has uh, a lot of plugins into traditional application uh, environment models. And the third one being Roll Your Own. You know, all of those three are very, very, uh, very real and very viable options to, to leverage. Thanks, Nick. Absolutely. Well, I just think in you know, conclusion, maybe we could just you know, get your summary of like what we should be expecting from you guys in the next uh, you know, three, six, three, six months. Absolutely. I, you know, first of all, I think that we'll, you'll see that um, ability to tie our cloud system offerings with uh, software-defined infrastructure and essentially the composable infrastructure that HP is so well known for is one of the things that we discover our customers are really interested in, is, is essentially making their infrastructure um, more uh, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud ready. And Cloud System 10 has done so already, and I think we're gonna be investing in making sure that customers can actually take their private clouds and run them very easily um, and uh, have this, almost the same value proposition, even better than some of the public cloud environments that we're so used to. Um, the other piece is being able to offer flexible choices, and you've 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 probed and asked a lot on the questions of well, can I do things this way? Can I do things the other way? Which cloud provider, or which component, or which container provider or orchestration engines can you support? And we're going to see, and you'll see a lot of uh, ability to support multiple different environments and multiple different uh, projects um, a lot easier. Also, being able to essentially 
uh, pick and choose if you're a developer, if you have specific preferences for different environments, you, you, know, you can uh, choose up and down the stack the components that you want to target within, within this one holistic uh, footprint that you want to deploy. Uh, all the way you know, from, the, from the bottom of, of hardware and the, the software and the templates that you, you run to define that hardware, all the way up into the CI, CI CD and runtime environments that you would expose to your developers. Um, you know, we, we really truly believe that there are many different paths to get to hybrid cloud. Um, Multi-cloud is kind of one of our core tenants. We truly believe that we're, we should be able to target different cloud environments and make, make the organization's uh, role uh, and, and job much easier by allowing a very easy path to target those environments within one model. And then helping them get into hybrid IT space as well, meaning that ability to move workloads across different cloud providers and do so very seamlessly is going to be one of the core, core focus points for, for what we're doing. So we're excited about this space. It, it's a very cool dynamic space. A lot of things are happening. We talked about cloud, we talked about containers. We see the same thing happening in, in across the board with different parts of the stack. And we're super excited because we have a, a very, very cool holistic value proposition across all elements of that stack. Um, so, we're going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot more from us on that very soon. Well, Nick, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us on this episode of the New Stack Analysts. And I also want to thank Job, Job Jackson, our managing editor at the New Stack. Thank you so much, Job, for being here today. And Shiram Subramanian, who is of Cloud Dawn and is very active in the OpenStack community and a, a knowledgeable uh, person about this whole. Uh, this whole uh, world of the new stack, so to speak. So thank you all for, for joining us today and we'll be back again soon. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Nick and Vidya. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all. Great. Thank you all. Thanks, folks. Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. We'd like to thank HPE Cloud, our sponsor for this week's episode of the New Stack Analyst. HPE Cloud offers an open enterprise-grade hybrid cloud portfolio of solutions and professional services. It drives that hybrid infrastructure, enables developers, and provides a unified solution. You should check them out. HPE Cloud. Thanks again, and I hope to see you back at the show. Bye-bye.